Good morning. Welcome back to the Outreach of the Heart Ministries this morning. What a what a wonderful time it was last week. As if you tuned in, I got to spend the weekend up at Sherman Reservoir and brought uh, was able to bring to you the sunrise from out in the middle of the lake off of the fishing boat. Oh, what a beautiful time that was. And then a couple hours later, was able to give you a message, a continuing message dealing with God's mercy. And what we learned from that message is grace and mercy go hand in hand. But we first have to accept God's grace, do we not? We have to accept God's grace. And who is grace? Jesus Christ is grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus is the gift that God gave to us. And we must believe through faith in that grace to receive it. And once we've believed through faith in Jesus Christ, mercy is bestowed upon us. Mercy is this bestowed upon us. And then, of course, in the sunrise message, we were talking about Jeremiah 29, 11, and the plans that God has for us. His desire for us to be is, is to be connected with him, to be in a relationship, a personal, intimate, deep, loving relationship with Jesus Christ. Not something superficial. Not something that rises to the occasion when we're in a time of need, but through the ups and downs of life, through the thick and the thin, if you will, through the sad and through the glad. How are you doing in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, do you feel as though you're really, really connected with him? At all times, you're just Oh my gosh, he's just there. He's life is grand. You're living in his presence. That's what he wants us to experience. But we need to be truthful here. Sometimes we experience a disconnect from God. A disconnect from God. How does that happen? What does that entail? And how can we overcome the disconnect? I want to share with you something that, that came across Facebook just yesterday. And I shared it to this page. And I noticed this morning as I, as I was going through and was preparing to print this off so I could read it, there was actually a portion of it that did not appear on this page. So even if you read this yesterday, there's just a little bit more to it. This is just an analogy, and, and wow, this really just reached out and grabbed me yesterday. It says, when God wanted to create fish, he spoke to the sea. When God wanted to create trees, he spoke to the earth. But when God wanted to create man, he turned to himself. As it's written in scripture, then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Who was he speaking to? God the Father was speaking to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Now, we may, may we make a note here and say that if you take a fish out of water, it's going to die, right? When you remove a tree from the soil, it too will die. And likewise, when man is disconnected from God, he also dies. Are you feeling a spiritual death occurring in you right now because of a disconnect with God? You see, God is our natural environment. We were created to live in his presence. We have to be connected. We have got to be connected. We have got to be connected to God because it is only in Him 
that life exists. Now this is the portion that didn't come across yesterday as I posted this. It says, let's stay connected to God. We recall that water without fish is still water. But fish without water is nothing. The soil without trees is still soil. But the tree without soil is nothing. So we come to this conclusion this morning. Praise be to God. God without man is still God. But man without God is nothing. So the call to stay connected with God. What interferes? We're going to find out something that interferes without us even acknowledging it. We're going to speak about overcoming the disconnect. And before we get into that, I, I want to bring something else up. The feeling of a disconnect. I had the opportunity to be in the presence of a dear young young friend of mine last night as she united in Christian marriage with the love of her life. And as I sat there in that sanctuary, a place where I used to travel multiple times a month to go out and lead a youth ministry. Of which this young woman, when she introduced me to her, her now husband, said, this is my youth pastor. But as I sat there in that sanctuary, this is a sanctuary where I, I stood before a group of young people and adults, and I shared the gospel, and I watched the spiritual growth take place in these young people as well as the spiritual maturity developed in the adults that were present. I had an opportunity to preach from the pulpit at one point, just once, from up on that stage in that sanctuary. I had the opportunity to receive a distinguished award from that congregation, a number of years ago. And I got to speak to a large group of people and give praise to God instead of receiving the praise upon myself. I gave him the glory. But as I sat there as a witness, I felt the disconnect. And I found myself in a deep prayer saying, Lord, it's been nearly, well, it's actually been over two years since I've been able to speak from an actual church building sanctuary. And I began to ask the Lord, where will you place me next? Where is the sanctuary? That you have for me. Well folks. This is my sanctuary. But there's a disconnect. Not between me and God. But between me. And people. And in the early morning hours. This morning. As I was awakened. The Lord was beginning to reveal. possibility of what's coming next and calling me to be faithful so folks I bring this up to you this morning because I ask for your prayers 
I ask for your prayers. Because this, this plan that the Lord was revealing to me this morning was not a plan of going and, and stepping into an existing sanctuary where someone else has already been speaking. Folks, this was a church plant. This was something new, a new beginning, an opportunity to share the gospel. Just where, I do not know. But I ask for your, your covering of this in your prayer. Pray for those opportunities. And the opportunity for those who will one day attend and hear the message of the cross. And come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, their Savior. So with that, let's join in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I come before you. We come before you this morning. Humbled. With deep gratitude. Lord, we're reminded that without you we are we are nothing. From the dust we were formed into the dust we will return. But you have told us through your word, through your promises, that there would one day be an eternal place where we would stay. Because, Lord, we know that this is only our temporary home. We're only here for a few short breaths of time. May we make the most of that time as we serve you, Lord. As we grow in our relationship with you, as we commune with you. As we live in your presence and allow you to live in us. So Lord, we just we just ask that you reveal to us this morning how to overcome this disconnect. Lord, I know it's going to be a topic that some people are just going to reject and say, no way, not me, not that person. I can't do it. But what if you said that to us? Or about us? And you spoke to God the Father and said, no way, Lord, not that person. I just can't do it. Not them. Lord, thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for dying on the cross for us and paying the penalty that we deserve. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So we've been talking about grace. We explained what grace was. We learned more about grace. We had the the, the flourishment, the the not the flourishment. What word? What word applies here, Lord? The fruitfulness of grace just blossom. That's the word I'm looking for in our life here a couple weeks ago. Because there was a, a connection that we could make. It was presented in such a way that we've never heard it before. And it just bloomed and blossomed. Because of that, prayerfully, we will bear much fruit from a message of grace. Because we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Then last week, out on the boat, we talked about mercy. We just had a heart-to-heart, one-on-one, actually two-on-one. Lord's words, my voice, and you and me as listeners. 
So we have grace, we have mercy. This morning we're going to talk about forgiveness. And if you heard in the prayer, I was alluding to this in the prayer, saying, no, Lord, not me, not that person. I can't do it. Why can't you forgive that person? What is it that they have done so wrong to you? You're making a list right now. A mental list. I know you are. Because I once did that. If you guys know me very well, you know that I grew up hating my earthly dad. Who to this day disowns me and says that I'm a product of my mother's affair, which I am not. I know that. But he has convinced himself, and he has disowned me as his child. But you know what? I have the greatest father that could ever, ever be in my life. Do I miss the opportunity of having a, an earthly dad? Yeah, I do. And I cherish being a dad to my children. Even though at times there seems to be a disconnect there. Because that's just what happens in the distractions of life. But forgiveness. I remember having multiple people tell me, Stace, you've got to forgive your dad. You've got to forgive your dad. You've got to forgive your dad. And I said, no way, not him. You see, because that was the that was the crutch that I was able to hold on to anger with. That was something that allowed me to be me, to be who I wanted to be. Or so I thought. And then the same weekend that I heard this message on grace, the Lord spoke to me through his word saying that if I do not forgive others, I will not receive the forgiveness of God the Father. I would not be able to live in God's mercy. Because I was not truly accepting His grace. Wow. Powerful words. So what happened? set out on a mission, led by the Lord, a path of forgiveness. And to this, this day, when I speak about my dad, there are no ill feelings. There are no regrets. There are no transgressions between the two of us. The fact that he disowns me is his business, not mine. He made that choice. And that's just part of life. It's just part of life. But I offered the forgiveness. And I also asked him for forgiveness. The last time I saw my dad was a number of years ago when he surprised me. He and his wife showed up at a, at a church that I was speaking at that morning. And the message was on the difference, the contrast between heaven and hell. And somewhere in the midst of that message, they got up and walked out. And I've seen nor heard anything of them since. Their decision. They walked away from the truth of God's word. And they walked right out of my life. But they're forgiven forgiven from where just my mind from my heart because that's what God instructs us to do we turn to Matthew turn with me to Matthew chapter 18 beginning in verse 21 
Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now look at how Peter is looking for a scapegoat. He's looking for a loophole. Lord, do I only have to forgive him up to seven times? Wouldn't that be great if we could say, okay, this person has sinned against me or has offended me or has done wrong against me. And well, it's he's done it five times. Next time will be six. And then, well, if he does it again, that's seven. And I don't have to forgive him anymore. I can be mad at him for the rest of my life. I can hold it against him. I'll have a, a, a right to judge him. I'll have a right to hate him. I will have a right to not be a part of him or her. But what does Jesus respond with? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Oh, Wow, so now, same scenario, this person keeps offending us, keeps hurting us in some way, so we're at 76, now it's 77, oh, that's not what that means, folks. 77 is a representative of an infinite number. It's a, the number seven is the number of perfection. it multiplies. How can you multiply perfection and end up with an imperfection? It doesn't work. So 77 times doesn't mean the literal 77, but it means unconditionally. Every time. Now some of you are thinking, now wait a minute. I've had some people in my life that have really mistreated me. Maybe I'm not going to get into details there. You know what I'm talking about. How do I forgive that person? You can't do it on your own. But through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, if you have accepted the gift of grace and you have received God's mercy, he has bestowed upon you the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that you can truly, authentically forgive someone, not just superficially, but from the heart. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to, able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. And this servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay everything back. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But the man refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. I'm not going to read the next verse for just a moment. How do you treat others? Do you treat others the way that Jesus has treated you? Jesus put his life on the cross for you and for me so that we could be in a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ, through him. 
He knew that that was the only way. He knew that that was the will of the Father. And he conceded and said, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. And he hung there in agony on that cross for you and for me. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. What are you doing for the forgiveness of the sins of others who have sinned against you? Are you harboring hatred, discord against them? Are you just avoiding them? Annoy, uh, annoying them, that's not the right word. You're not annoying them. Well, maybe you are. Maybe you're allowing them to annoy you. But that's not the key word here. Are you avoiding them? Are you allowing yourself to be disconnected from them? You see, it wasn't until I learned that my dad had accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, or so I was told. I'm not sure of that evidence now. That I began a relationship with him, that I reached out to him. This was after I had forgiven him. Nearly a year after I had forgiven him, I got word that my dad had accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And he began to build this relationship with me. After years of a disconnect. Years of a disconnect. Verse 35. Of Matthew 18 says, This is how your heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. From your heart, not just your mind, not just in idle words, but words that come from the heart. And I said earlier, you cannot authentically, truly forgive someone without the power of the Holy Spirit that is in you. They are merely idle words that Satan will bring back and escalate the wrong that someone has done against you unless you have truly forgiven them from the heart. How many of you are holding a grudge against someone? All the way back to what that girl or that boy or, or whoever, that teacher, that uncle, that aunt, that grandfather, cousin of yours that did to you when you were little. Are you holding a grudge against that person? Does that person even know what stands between you and them? Do you see what has happened and what was happening to me in my own life, I wasn't hurting my dad. I was hurting me. And my relationships with people that were around me, including my wife and my children, my friends and my co-workers. And I felt ironic that when I forgave my dad. It was just a matter of weeks and I came home to an empty house. Because there was a change that occurred in me that it seemed my wife could not handle. I went from an angry, disconnected individual the one who was set free from the bondage of hatred, from the bondage of unforgiveness. And it was more than she could bear. Because she herself was not a follower of Jesus Christ, and still to this day is not. But even that, turned around and had to forgive my dad or forgive my dad 
And then I turned around and I had to forgive my wife. It's not easy, folks. But without the power of the Holy Spirit, I would not have been able to do it. But why is it so important to forgive? This is how my Heavenly Father will treat each of us unless we forgive our brother or sister from the heart. And it's not just a financial thing. This is of any wrong that has been done against us. Let us turn to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 35 to 40. This is Solomon speaking. He says, when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you. He's speaking to the Lord. And when they pray toward this place, this is the, this is the, the temple that Solomon built. And when they pray toward this place and give praise to your name and turn from their sin because they have afflicted them, because you have afflicted them. Verse 36, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send rain on the land where you gave your people. Send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance. Verse 37, when famine or plague comes to the land, or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, or when an enemy besieges them in any of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come, and when a prayer or plea is made by anyone among your people, Israel, being aware of the afflictions of their own hearts and spreading out their hands towards this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Forgive and act. Forgive and and act. Deal with everyone according to all they do, since you know their hearts. For you alone know every human heart, so that they will fear you all the time they live in the land you gave our ancestors. Solomon is asking the Lord to hear the prayers of the people who are coming and asking for forgiveness knowing that it will set them free from the bondage that they've been living in. And he's asking the Lord to not only hear the prayers, but to act upon them. In the letter that Paul wrote to Philemon, there's only one chapter, verses, and in, in verses 17 and 18 it says, So if you consider me a partner, Paul speaking to Philemon. And he's speaking about a certain slave that in some way or another offended or done something against Philemon. And Paul is saying, Philemon, you need to forgive this servant, this former slave. I am sending him to you. So he says, Philemon, if you consider me a partner, Welcome this servant as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. This is an amazing set of scripture right here. Because this points directly back to Jesus Christ. When he died on the cross, he said, not verbally, but his actions. When he took upon the, the penalty of death that we deserve, Lord, if they have wronged you or owe you anything, Father, charge it to me. Charge it to me. That is what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and for me. As he became... The atoning sacrifice. The only sacrifice pleasing to God for the forgiveness of our sins. To enable us to be in a relationship with the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. 
And I want you to ask yourself this. Is there someone in your life that has offended you? That has hurt you in some way? That owes you anything? And you harbor some sort of ill feeling towards that individual? Are you willing to say to that individual in person or from the heart, speak it to God? And say, I want to welcome him or her as you would welcome him or her. I want to welcome this person into my life just as I desire for you, Lord, to welcome this person into your life, your family, the kingdom of God. And if this person has done anything wrong, May I pay the debt. You're saying, you are out of your mind. I'm not going to forgive someone in that such a way. What is God saying through the Apostle Paul to this man named Philemon? God is saying through Paul. And Paul is offering that if this person has done anything against you or owes you anything, charge it to me. Because you know why we're able to do that as Christians? Because we know that if we take that and that person actually gives that to us, it's already gone because our sins are forgiven. The sins of others are forgiven if we will accept them upon ourselves. Now, Stace, you're, you're borderline there with some teaching of some other cultish beliefs, such as purgatory, where, where they believe that you can pray someone into heaven who has already died. No, that's not what we're talking about. I'm saying that we need to forgive our brothers and sisters no matter what wrong they've done against us. No matter what they have done against us. Regardless. Are we saving that person? Not necessarily. Who are we saving? Ourselves. How are we saving ourselves? I didn't know we could save ourselves. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about saving ourselves. Setting, allowing ourselves to be set free from the chains, the bondage of hatred, discord, and unforgiveness. Are you willing to forgive someone? Philemon didn't want to. But God spoke to him through the Apostle Paul. Who is God speaking to you through? Is it through this message this morning? We turn to Psalm 130, verses 3 and 4. It says, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. So what Paul was saying is, Philemon, for you to be able to serve the Lord, you need to forgive this servant who wronged you. You need to forgive, or you cannot, with reverence, with awe, love, inspiring, serve the Lord. There is a disconnect, Philemon, between you and the Lord because of your unforgiveness. There is a disconnect between you and the Lord because of your unforgiveness of someone else. There is a disconnect between you and the Lord if you cannot forgive yourself of something that you've done. There is a disconnect. And what did this, this analogy this morning say? 
We recall that water without fish is still water, but fish without water is nothing. The soil without tree is still soil, but the tree without soil is nothing. God without man, without you and me, is still God. But you and me without God is nothing. We remain in the bondage. We remain in the prison of unforgiveness. And Jesus Christ died to set us free. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now wait a minute. I thought the gospel message was Jesus loves me and everything's going to be okay. Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. If you go into some other non-biblical teaching, it's going to tell you that if you're baptized in water, your sins are forgiven. So how can this be? That if we don't forgive others, the Father will not forgive us? I thought my sins were already forgiven. What happens here? Why, why does this seem like a contrast? For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. Lord, I thought I was already forgiven. But you see, God judges the attitude of the heart. Not your words, not your actions, but your heart. <coughs> Have you truly forgiven someone? Because when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the desire of forgiveness, to give what you have received, is so powerful in your life, you cannot help but offer it. So when I read this, this is what I hear. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. When you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will forgive because of the forgiveness that you have received. That's what I hear. But then verse 15 says, But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This says to me, But if you do not receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and accept his forgiveness, you cannot forgive others. Because as was said earlier, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. When do you receive the power of the Holy Spirit? When you say, I do, to Jesus Christ. When you enter into a marriage relationship, a covenant with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then and only then do you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Then and only then do you receive the power within your heart to truly, authentically, eternally, Forgive someone. Mark 3, 28, 29 says, Truly I tell you, people can be forgiven all of their sins and every slander they utter. So people can be forgiven. That can be is through Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. So truly I tell you, as Jesus speaks, People can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. There's word out there of, of the unpardonable sin. And people want to label that unpardonable sin. We don't have to label it because God did. It's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's the unpardonable sin. Many of you want to say homosexuality or this or that is the unpardonable sin. God's word doesn't say that. It says that homosexuality and murder and those things are sin. But he says people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Now, I want to reiterate something here. 
People can be forgiven all their sin, but they have to choose to separate themselves from that sin. It's called repentance. We can't just live in a lifestyle of sin. We can't choose to live a sinful lifestyle and expect to be forgiven. It doesn't work that way. And if we're speaking against the Holy Spirit, blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, there will never be forgiveness. That person is guilty of an eternal sin. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Verses 30 through 32. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Why? did God include in this message three different warnings of speaking against the Holy Spirit? Because it's a warning. Folks, if you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit, there is no forgiveness. All other sins can be forgiven. We turn to Psalm. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. What is the law of the Lord? We just read one of the laws of the Lord. It isn't one of the Ten Commandments. It's, but it told us it was a warning. The laws of the Lord are warnings towards us. Warnings for us to realize the sin that is in us. And to turn from that sin. The law of the Lord is perfect. And it refreshes the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. Making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. Giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant. Giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure. Enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm. And all of them are righteous. Now verse 10. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. And in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Or in another translation, it says, my secret faults, my secluded faults. Verse 13, keep your servant also from willful sins. May thou not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. How many of us are praying that we don't sin against God? That's pretty obvious. We don't want to sin against God. We don't want to sin against Jesus Christ. We don't want to sin against the Holy Spirit. But how often do we think to pray that I don't sin against another individual? We don't think about that, do we? Because in reality, when we sin against another individual, we sin against God. We sin against Jesus Christ. We sin against the Holy Spirit. That's not the unpardonable sin. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's not what we've done here. We've sinned against another individual. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins and let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. 
May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We turn to Mark chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels of the New Testament. Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. And John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Repentance is a key word in there. We turn to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, verses 15 to 18. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? This is Saul as he's converted into Paul on the road to Damascus. Lord, who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see from, of me. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they re may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Did Jesus Christ, did God through Jesus Christ forgive Saul? Saul was a persecutor of Christians. He was a murderer. And on the road to Damascus, God knocks him to his knees and calls him to a position of authority. Under the leadership of God himself. Have you wronged people so much that you feel that you cannot be forgiven by someone else? Do you feel that you've wronged people so much that you can't be forgiven by God himself? Others may not forgive you. Because they're not being led by the Holy Spirit. So we turn to our Father and ask for forgiveness of the sins we have committed against others. And if we have committed sins against others, we go and offer them forgiveness. We ask for them to forgive us. We offer it to them as a testimony of who Jesus Christ is. Are you willing to go to someone who you have sinned against and seek forgiveness? Are you willing to go up to someone who has sinned against you and say, I forgive you for what you've done? You don't have to name it. Just speak it. I forgive you. You remember what Jesus said as he hung on the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What did Stephen say as he was being stoned to death? Forgive them, Lord. Forgive them. Are you willing to forgive? Mark 11, 24 and 25 says this, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. When we speak to the Lord in the, in the will of the Lord, 
We are to expect that what we pray for, we will receive. There's a difference between praying in the Spirit, praying in the will of God, and just uttering a prayer. And verse 25 says, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. This comes back to us once again. This is a warning once again. If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them. So that, as a result of, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Folks, we've got to get this idea out of our head that when we accept Jesus Christ, we're forgiven whether we forgive anybody else or not. We have to understand that true, authentic relationship with Jesus Christ drives us drives us to forgive others as Christ has forgiven us. Without forgiveness, there is a chasm between us and God. There is a major disconnect. Do you feel disconnected from God? Through this message, God has revealed to us how to overcome that disconnect. Because we must accept God's grace. We must accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Welcome his mercy. And give forgiveness as we have been forgiven. Next week we're going to talk about another difficult word. Called repentance. Turning away. But before we get to that, have you accepted God's grace? Are you living in view of God's mercy? Are you forgiving others as Christ has forgiven you? Are you feeling a disconnect? Look into those three areas of your life. And see where the barrier between you and God lies. Because if there's a disconnect, it's going to fall, in my opinion, in one of those three areas. You either haven't truly accepted grace. And if you haven't accepted grace, you're not living in view of his mercy. And you have no power to forgive from the heart. Where are you lacking? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we close this message. And we thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for reminding us that we must forgive others. For if we don't, we cannot receive the forgiveness that you gave us. Through your grace and your mercy, you build into us, deep within our heart, through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us, the desire to forgive others, to treat others as we have been treated by you. For the wages of sin is death, and you died in my place. May I die to others. In forgiveness. I love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.